Welcome to another short video looking at using open frameworks for creative coding. And in this video, I'm going to talk about how to make slit scan cameras and look at image processing and come up with some simple ideas. The code that I'll be using is on the Creative Technology Toolkit sessions, which is available at ue-creative-technology slash CT Toolkit sessions. And we're going to be looking at the slit scan example. I've downloaded this already and I have it in my Open Frameworks folder. And if I go to my folder structure, you'll see inside Open Frameworks, inside My Apps, I have the whole of the CT Toolkit sessions. And we're going to look at this one, the slit scan example. So if I open that up, you'll see it has a standard fault structure. I'm not using any add-ons or any additional configuration. I have a readme file and I have a screenshot example of what hopefully you will see when you run this first. And also included is a zipped version of a Mac OS X binary that's already compiled. So you can download this and run it on a similar Macintosh system, but it'll also compile for Windows and for Linux. Again, the stuff we're interested in is actually just these in the source folder. I'm using Xcode, but you can edit in VS Code, of which there's another video about how to use Visual Studio Code. You can also edit in Visual Studio, Qt Creator, or straight in any of your favorite text editors and launch from the command line. So I'm going to launch Xcode and set this up. And if I click on my folder, I can see the structure in my source folder. I have a main which launches Open Frameworks as an app inside or a process inside a C++. I have my application header file, which is very, very simple. All that I've put in these simple pieces down here. I've taken out a lot of the standard loops that you might see, the functions for mouse detection and so on. You don't need them. It makes things much simpler. We're just going to have a setup, an update, and a draw. And we're going to listen with this function for key presses, and that's going to pass us back whatever the key is pressed. I am using a new object, which is the OF Video Grabber. So this is an object that Open Frameworks can build and it understands. And I'm making an instance of that called Vid Grabber. I'm making a pixel buffer called Video Inverted, and I'm making a texture called video texture. And then I'm making three integers. And in this instance, I'm listing them all out on one line with a comp between each and a semicolon at the end, just for ease. These could be all on separate lines like so, if I wanted, with a semicolon finishing each line. But it allows me to keep integers and booleans and floats all together and make my code a little bit more organized. And as you can see, naming wise, I'm using what they call camel case, where I start variable names with a lowercase letter and where they're separated words, I use an uppercase letter on all the following words. <clears throat> One of the things I'm actually going to do here, I'm using the standard configuration for the Xcode editor and it's dark on light, but I actually prefer light on dark. It helps me see the colors a bit more, but this is preference. Many editors will allow you to set up your colors and your color hinting. And I'm just going to go to Xcode Preferences and have a look at fonts and colors. And down here are a load of basics. And I like the dusk one, dark. It allows me to see the difference between various colors for comments, etc., more easily. And it flips the color of my editor. And if I zoom in a little bit more, we can see our code. So we have our header file in here, void loop, uh, um, setup loop, update loop, draw loop. We're going to listen for key presses. We've made an object that'll grab video. We've made two picture objects and some integers that we're going to use values throughout our code. If I come to my off app C++, you can see at the beginning of my setup, I set the cam width to 640, the cam height to 480. This is the size at which we're going to ask the video camera connected to this computer, in this instance a laptop, 
to grab a picture that size. And most cameras attached to the computers will capture at a set number of different sizes. So if you put in 100 by 100, unless you've got a camera that knows how to grab square images, it'll probably give you an error. 640, 480 will work for pretty much any camera. 320 by 240, and then up from there, depending upon what kind of camera you've got. But these settings should work pretty much with anything Mac, Windows, Linux to start off with. And if you have higher resolution cameras, you can increase these values uh, to grab a higher resolution image. Our variable x steps, which we're going to use for counting through, I'm initializing to zero. And I always try and remember to initialize things at the beginning so that if we ask for it later, there's not a null value that will crash our program. <clears throat> Then just to help me set up and see what video devices are attached to this, it could be that I have three or four different cameras, I'm going to build a vector, which is a, a list of video devices, uh, called devices, and I'm going to ask the video grabber to return a list of all the things that it thinks are attached to this computer and put them into this list devices. And then I'm just going to go through this list devices and say, please, will you print them out? So this is a debug that's not necessary, but it will help you first running to see what devices are available in case you need to choose which one you want to grab from. So all this will do is loop through however many devices have been found and put in the list devices and then say use off log notice and output it into our log console window down here. We'll see that when it runs. Now, having run my code before and commonly knowing a Mac, the video grabber device ID for the internal camera is usually zero. For PC and Linux, it may well be the same, but double check in case you want to grab from a different numbered device and you alter that in this video grabber set device. Once you set it up, it'll continue to grab from that. And then we can set the grab frame rate. If we have a high-speed camera, we can increase this frame rate. There may be reasons why we don't need to grab so fast and we only want to grab very slowly. And then we tell the video grabber that we want to initialize the width and the height using these integers that we set up up here at the top. Once the camera grabber is set up, we can just keep asking it for images. <coughs> the camera grabber is now configured. We tell it which camera to grab from. We tell it the frame rate we want to grab at we tell it the width and the height that we want to grab the image at. And then we're going to make up some video buffers to move pixels around, as we did with the previous video, <clears throat> looking at video input and manipulation, where we inverted video and so on. We're going to copy the pixels out of the images that come from the video camera and manipulate them. And we need somewhere to put them. So we made these two video objects, the video texture, the video inverted, and we're going to allocate them, which is to say how big they should be, how much memory should they should have stored, uh, saved for them. So I set the width and the height, and I tell it that I want it to be RGB pixels. If it were grayscale, it would need less information. This allows it to be red, green, and blue, millions of colors. And then having set up the video inverted, I just use that as a reference to set up the video texture to be the same width, height, and color depth. Down here, I set the color background to be 100, 100, 100, which is a sort of dark gray. And then I'm ready to go. In my update loop, which is going to run continuously, I ask the video grabber to go to the camera and update and see if there's a new picture from the camera. And then I take the pixels from that image and put them into a new pixels object. Pixels object allows us to address the individual pixels inside an object, in this case, the image that we've got from the camera. And then I make a for loop. And the loop goes through all of the pixels on a line across the width of the image coming from the camera. So it counts through starting with zero, going to the width of the image, increasing each time with y plus plus, which is y equals y plus one, and it loops through all the pixels on the line. And the first thing that it does is we make a new color object which understands color and we get the color at our position y and the position x steps. 
And if you remember, we initialized x steps here at 0. So it'll start off at line 0, moving across one pixel at a time across the top line of our video picture. And it'll get that color of each individual pixel, put it into color, and then it'll copy that into our video inverted it'll, uh, video buffer. It'll set the color at our position with the color. And then we flip the data from video inverted and load it into the video texture. And then this little piece at the end just says, keep adding one to X steps. So it'll keep going line by line. But if you get to the end of the height of the camera, reset it to zero. So it'll count all the way down through the image and then start at zero and count all the way down through the image. And that's the end of the update. So this runs a loop, counting down and going across, just like we did when we were setting and copying pixels in the video from session two, counting through all the pixels, one line after another, counting across and then coming down. And in draw, all we're gonna do is take the video that we're getting straight from the camera and draw it at zero, zero, so, uh, the top left-hand side of the screen, and then we're going to take the video that we've just loaded into video texture, which has been copied a line at a time, and we're going to draw that as well. This time we're going to start with the camera width. So it's, it's next to the image we've just drawn from the camera at position zero, and the width and the height are going to be the same as the camera. And the only thing that I've got here is in the function listening to see if a key has been pressed, I'm saying if the key is the lowercase f, or the uppercase F, use this function, OF toggle full screen. And it does exactly that. If the screen window is full screen, it'll take it back to its original window size. And if it's not, it'll open it up to full screen. So if I build this now, so sending this to compile, our example should compile and we see on one side, the video coming straight from the video camera, being drawn from the video grabber as one complete unit. And on the other side, we have an interesting thing going on. If I come out of the way of the camera slightly, you'll see that line after line after line, we're taking portions of the image from the video grabber and in slices, drawing them into our target image. And if nothing changes in the image, we don't see any difference. But because one side of the image is actually older, than the other because those slices have been grabbed before, little slices drawing one after another across the image. We get a whole range of different effects as the image is copied from one place to the other. So I can move around within the image and anything that moves as a scan line essentially moves will be distorted. Now, coming back to our code, it's all happening in this update function. We get the image from the video, we put it into this pixels object, and then we loop through the pixels object, step at a time through the image, over time, successive images that we're grabbing from the camera and copying a different slice each time and copying it into its correct position in our target image. But if I keep grabbing from one specific point in our source image and then lay it down into our target image, we get a very different effect. So here, where we're getting the pixel color from a particular position and X steps is looping through as we're adding x steps equals x plus one down here. Instead, I'm gonna say, grab from the middle of the camera, right in the middle of the camera, and copy it into our target image, but keep grabbing from the very middle of the camera. So I'm gonna say, grab from cam width, to make it the middle, divide the width of the camera by two, and that'll give me the middle pixel. Grab from that, and then copy it into our target image. And what we'll have, it's a very different kind of slit scan effect. 
So now, if I move out of the way, you'll see that the camera is grabbing a full image, but our slit scan is grabbing the middle pixel and laying it down in successive slices along our target image, which means that anything that changes in this middle portion of the camera over time gets reflected in slices in our target image that move across. And if we move through at around the right rate, you'll see we get a reasonable representation. But if we move through in other ways, we get huge temporal distortions where one side of the image is coming from a particular point at a different time. So we can get wonderful Ribbing, ribboning effects, and anything that's moving through that center portion of the image will appear completely distorted. So that's the basics of slit scan imagery. There's many, many different artists that have been working with this idea. Um, try it yourself of being able to scan vertically scan horizontally, maybe a combination of the two, to scan every other line, to scan at different speeds, even to say, I'm going to randomly choose a scan line to connect from, and then randomly choose a scan line to write it through, or choose a line to scan from, copy it to the corresponding line, but do it temporarily randomly so you have a ribbon of different time slices put together, even try and draw it circular, spherical, Go through and have a look at some of the examples and have a play with the existing code and let me know how you get on.